Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this quarter's Corporate Cash Briefing webinar. You are listening, again, to the largest and longest-running conversation on corporate cash decisions in our industry. Uh, I'm Kevin Ruiz, the Principal at Treasury Strategies, uh, which is a division of Novantis, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Tony Carfang, as well as today's panelists, Michelle Price, uh, an Associate Policy and Technical Director with the Association of Corporate Treasurers, Debbie Cunningham, Chief Investment Officer for Federated Investors, and Greg Favilovich, a Director with Fitch Ratings. Again, as we've been doing for a decade, today we're going to discuss these corporate cash levels, and then our panelists are going to discuss the key issues that are top of mind to corporate treasurers today. Uh, I, before we begin, I want to remind everyone who's registered for this session that in a day or so, you're going to receive a copy of the presentation and a link to this recording. And, and if you want to ask any questions, you can do so in the question box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We'll handle those questions offline in the coming days as well. So thanks very much. Let's get started here. Uh, as we look at corporate cash levels on uh, slide four here, we, we've been looking at this from uh, the previous quarter to this quarter, and one of the interesting things we've noticed is in all four of these jurisdictions, there's been a minimal amount of change in the corporate cash levels themselves. Looking on slide four here, you see the corporate cash in the U.S. and U.K., Euro and Japan has not substantially changed, which is interesting in the context of the next few slides here, because we do see changes as we go to slide five. Uh, sorry, these, these aren't substantial changes in slide five here. These are still the corporate cash levels. We see that as they regress against time, there's not much change here in the December numbers from the September numbers. As we go on to slide six, you see again, there's not a substantial change in corporate cash as a percent of GDP by region. We are very interested in hearing from everybody that's attending this webinar on what their thoughts are around both corporate cash levels as well as cash levels as a percentage of GDP. Now the interesting thing here is in slides seven and eight, because while we don't see a substantial level of corporate cash relative to nominal GDP in any of the four jurisdictions, as we go to this final slide eight here, we see something substantially different. Treasury strategies and our partners, as well as this, this panel itself, we have been talking uh, for multiple sessions around the changes in money market fund reform and how those changes may impact the corporate treasurers as they move money from potentially from prime funds to government funds and back again. That has been something that we've been paying attention to for a long time now. As we looked at these numbers coming up in December of last year, we see in the U.S. that the reserve balances are at just over $2 trillion. If you go back and look at the September numbers, they were at $2.26 trillion. The drop of over $200 billion in the U.S., you see an associated uh, drop in the Bank of England, which isn't as substantial, but it's still there. And then you start to see a climb at the European Central Bank and no movement at uh, the Bank of Japan. This is something that we talk about consistently in amongst ourselves as well as with our clients. Tony Carfang, you're here with me today, and we, we also have been talking about this. Help me understand, what, what kinds of hypotheses do you have about what might be going on here? Thank you, Kevin. You know, it, we, as we look at the numbers here at Treasury Strategies and we help our clients decipher what's going on in the marketplace, uh, I, I, I can't help but think that the decline in balances, reserve balances at the Fed, the, these are re reserves that banks keep on deposit at the Fed on which they earn, earn an overnight interest rate, has declined uh, from the 2013-2014 period by about $600 billion. Uh, and it's interesting that we see the slope of that decline accelerating. When we, when we look at this, uh, we, we actually see a, a, a similar pattern uh, to the outflow of assets from prime money market funds that, uh, that, that fell by about $1.2 trillion, uh, prime and tax exempt funds together over the last couple of years. Uh, and if you keep in mind that one of the things that prime money funds invested in were, were bank liabilities, either uh, uh, CDs or commercial paper or other paper or repurchase agreements. And in fact, as we've gone back and checked the statistics from the uh, beginning of 2014 through the uh, beginning of 2017, over that three-year period, uh, 
money fund holdings of bank liability instruments have fallen by about $600 billion and have fallen, at least through year-end, at an accelerating rate, almost identical. Unfortunately, we don't have the two charts uh, to put together to show you this morning. We, we, we might do that at, at next quarter's cash briefing. Uh, but it leads us to a hypothesis that perhaps um, as banks lost funding from money funds, they actually made up that funding by uh, withdrawing their reserve deposits at the Fed. If that were true, there are a lot of implications for that uh, since the uh, – the reserves at the Fed count as high-quality liquid assets under Basel III, and if you substitute Treasury collateral for that, we have all sorts of uh, implications in, in, in the money market. Frankly, we're not sure. But if you look at these charts, and you know, as Treasury strategies, we're trained as consultants, so we ask ourselves, what's different about this picture? Uh, we have one jurisdiction in the upper left where we have a, a decline in reserve balances and the others where we don't see that same decline. And what's different about the jurisdiction in the upper left? It's the only one that's implemented money market fund regulations to the extent that we have. Uh, so we're going to be exploring that over the next quarter, and we'd really like your input on that. We, and, you know, if, if there's something here, this could be a real gem. Thanks, Tony. Why is this jurisdiction different than all other jurisdictions, right? I think now's the time of year to ask that question. <laughs> so, Tony, uh, as we move forward into our uh, deep dive here, maybe you want to go through uh, the discussion on changes to the geopolitical order. Well, as, as you know, things are changing all around, and you know, there's been a seismic shift in the uh, geopolitical landscape. Uh, you know, beginning with uh, Brexit last summer and the U.S. elections. Uh, We've had elections in other jurisdictions. We have France coming up, uh, all of which signal uh, yeah, sort of political parties aside, they, 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 they signal to us a move from uh, uh, multilateral approaches to solving geopolitical issues to bilateral approaches. Uh, that there, there's an implication here that we, we, we think that, that really impacts the, uh, the, the, the money markets and, and corporate treasury. You know, multilateral organizations put in place after World War II have really dominated the landscape for the last 70 years. And, uh, you know, all developed countries belong to some set of, of, of multilateral organizations. And if, if, if this political shift uh, takes hold, continues, or, or even stays where, where it is, that has a profound uh, impact. If you think about the role of multilateral organizations, for, for example, uh, you know, we, we could pick any one of these, the G20, the Basel Committee. Uh, so B Basel, the Bank for International Settlements came up with regulations that impact banks worldwide. And e e even though different jurisdictions are able to implement those regulations differently, uh, in effect what has happened is every, every, every member country uh, uh, has, has ceded some sort of sovereignty to uh, to an international order here, and uh, you know that leads to a one size fits all solution in many cases, as as, as, as we've seen, uh, particularly in response to the financial crisis. And what is systemically important in one jurisdiction may or may not be systemically important in another jurisdiction. What what is risk in one jurisdiction may actually be. Uh, prudent business as usual operations in another, and so so, so these are being called into question. Uh, the Financial Stability Board, uh, which is attempted to oversee global financial regulation, uh, beginning with conversations around uh, Dodd-Frank in the U.S., uh, uh, EMIR and others uh, you know, in, in other parts of the world, uh, I, I, I think is probably the most vulnerable of all the institutions. Now, as, as we know, uh, political organizations don't die, so I'm not going to predict that the FSB is going to go away. It just may have nothing to do. Uh, and, and, and I think what that means is each country or each jurisdiction will take more control over its destiny. Now, if we look at some of the global implications of this, you know, uh, we, we see changes in market structure. Uh, if you move from regional blocks or other political blocks into uh, you know, bilateral scenarios, 
by definition, you're introducing more complexity. Uh, and, and in the markets, you're going to have different regulations in different different jurisdictions. You're not going to have the long sought after harmonization that regulators, particularly at the FSB, for you know, for the last eight years, have been trying to, to to force feed into the market. And so you're going to have less standardization in the markets, more complexity, and that certainly has an implication for how you organize your treasury affairs. Uh, interest rates. Uh, you'd like to see more divergence as each each country um, des, you know, decides where it wants to be on on, on, on that particular continuum um, <clears throat> foreign exchange rates are obviously uh, would, would have more volatility and a perfect example of what going from multilateral to bilateral means um, I think can be illustrated with with trade policy so for example uh, if you had a block of five countries and a second block of five countries and they negotiated a trade agreement with each other, you would have one trade agreement between the five countries of block A, the five countries of block B. And you as corporate treasurers need, need to manage the cash flows and the, and, and, and the trades and the foreign exchange around that. Now, if you, if, if you move to fully bilateral, uh, then each of the five countries in Block A would have agreements with each of the five countries in Block B, and you would have 25 trade agreements to manage, uh, you know, an, an exponential increase here. And while I don't think that's going to happen, you know, like right around the corner, we're certainly moving in that direction. And again, as, as corporate treasurers, you need to, uh, to, to prepare for that. Uh, the role of central banks uh, we see in the new political order uh, being diminished. Uh, they took on an outsized role in, 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 in the aftermath of the financial crisis. In the U.S. alone, the Fed's balance sheet <clears throat> ballooned from about $1 trillion to about $4.5 trillion. Now, we, we saw on that earlier graph uh, how the uh, reserves, which actually fund the Fed's balance sheet, are starting to decline. And, 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 and Janet Yellen, the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, has talked about uh, beginning to trim the actual size of the balance sheet somewhere around the year-end period, and, we'll, and we'll, uh, our panel will talk about that in, in a little bit. But, but essentially, uh, you know, central banks have, have, have purchased uh, every asset in the marketplace that hasn't been nailed down, and it's sitting on their balance sheets. And at some point, that will unwind, and the, uh, the, 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 the role that they played uh, will diminish. Uh, I'd like to make a point under regulation, because with this geopolitical shift, there's a uh, a sort of a quiet rebellion against global regulation and more nationalistic determination, uh, and there's a sense that not all of the regulations have worked out according to plan, uh, and it, uh, you, know, you don't have to pick up very many newspapers to read uh, a lot of articles about how uh, legislatures around the world are thinking about rolling back some regulations. There's, there's an interesting twist here, though. Uh, a couple months ago, I, I testified in the United States Congress about the uh, money market fund regulations and the $1.2 trillion that have left prime and tax exempt funds. Uh, and I'm you know, doing this on behalf of our corporate treasury clients who've lost a, a, a viable uh, short-term investment instrument. And in, in that process, it became clear that members of both sides of the aisle, both the Democratic side of the aisle and the Republican side of the aisle, I, I would say 80% of them collectively acknowledged that a $1.2 trillion outflow was not what was intended and was something that probably ought to be remedied somehow. Now. Uh, no agreement on how to remedy that, but, you know, the first step is the recognition of the problem, and there was clear recognition of the problem. Now, does that mean the money fund regulations will get rolled back in the new Congress or uh, with a new uh, composition of the Securities and Exchange Commission? And my, my answer to that, curiously, is that depends on you. And here's what I mean. There's a concept that you probably all remember from business school called regulatory capture. And that's where the regulated seem to, at some point, accommodate and adapt to the regulations nicely 
and um, may not be interested in having the regulations rolled back. Uh, you know, coming up, you know, over the last several years, uh, banks were talking about the need to repeal Dodd-Frank. Well, all of a sudden, we have uh, an administration that might repeal Dodd-Frank, and now some of the bank trade groups are saying, well, not so fast. Maybe we need to study this. And the same in the money market fund industry and, 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 and others. That's called regulatory capture. Now, as corporate treasurers, you, you're not active lobbyists, but what, what you need to do here is to tell, uh, make sure your financial services providers, your banks, your fund companies, uh, your investment banks, uh, make sure they understand what you need from the financial system and how financial regulation and regulatory changes have impacted you so that their lobbying organizations can, in fact, uh, accommodate the needs of you, their customers. And unless you do that, frankly, I think uh, a lot of what we're hearing about regulatory reform, reform will fall by the wayside because of what I referred to as regulatory capture. Now, what does this mean for corporate treasury? Well, first of all, increased complexity. Uh, and our clients, the treasury strategies, our, our, our corporate treasury clients are, are, are looking at putting in place more analytics inside their treasury function, and they're relying more heavily on their external partners to help them with that. And those external partners can be uh, banks, uh, they can be accounting firms, law firms, consulting firms like Treasury Strategies. Uh, because of the complexity and, 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 and the need for specialization, it's impossible for a company, you know, under $100 billion of revenue, I guess, to really fully staff up to, to, to have the ultimate expertise in each of the areas that they need to cover. So uh, in putting together your A team, that has got to include uh, external partners. In terms of managing interest rate movements, many, many of our clients are uh, re-examining their hedging strategies, and they're also putting in place technology to help them uh, uh, you know, uh, man manage the, uh, the, 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 the their hedging and, the, and, and and their strategies. Availability of credit, you know, we we don't know what's going to happen when central banks de delever their balance sheets. Uh, we don't know what happens. What, what's going to happen when all of the uh, uh, toxic mix of Dodd Frank and Basel III, whatever, get fully implemented? In fact, the last plank of Basel III, uh, with, with uh, a, a, a stability ratio, isn't even set to be implemented until next year. Um, it's important for corporations to, to to keep their oxygen flowing, and that that means have access to credit. Uh, and that means uh, you know, relationship management is more important. Um, we expect the cost of bank services to continue to rise as interest rates rise. That makes, the, frankly, that makes the value of the bank services uh, the value, it makes bank services even more valuable. Um, and uh, obviously, as corporate treasurers, you need to manage that. I'm not going to go into detail on our 2017 corporate treasury priorities. They are on our website, uh, and they will be in the deck that you're going to receive at, at, at the end of the presentation. Uh, but but, but you know, just at a high level, you can see here, uh, cash forecasting and financial risk management uh, are perennial number one and number two, which, which means th th these things must be hard to do if they're always at the top of the list. And, uh, and in our consulting practice, uh, that's exactly what we see. Interesting, there are a couple of organizational items up here. I, I, I think as the financial crisis is now in the rearview mirror and we're at a new starting line, corporate treasurers are rethinking uh, the way they uh, uh, face off against the financial marketplace and fund their organizations. And then obviously, as you see at the bottom, the, the relationship management issues. So the, the, those are what we see as the top priorities. Um, and stay tuned, but you know, Treasury Strategies is gonna be watching these geopolitical changes for you. And uh, we look forward to, to, to working with you as you navigate through them. Thanks so much, Tony. Let's, uh, let's move on to our panel discussion. And, and we're gonna start by talking about 
political risk and the regulatory impact uh, that, that Tony mentioned. Uh, Michelle Price uh, with uh, the Association of Corporate Treasurers, let me start with you. You know, when I'm, when I'm hearing Tony talk, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, trade relations overall is really a big one and moving from this multilateral approach to what I see as a, a series of unilateral approaches in this bilateral agreement. And what's happening is, I think, um, we're moving from this uh, very well thought out system that started after World War II, um, moved into this WTO, you know, uh, aspirational <laughs> uh, process, but it's become more of a spaghetti bowl. It's becoming more of a spaghetti bowl as we move forward. Uh, step aside from trade for a second and just think about what other regulatory impacts are, are we expecting to see? What other things may be coming down the line that we need to think about, not just as, as uh, you know, an audience watching the world as it, as it uh, moves forward, but as corporate treasurers as well? Michelle, what, what thoughts do you have about that? Kevin, I guess my thoughts on political risk, um, I mean, first of all, I feel like I'm stating the obvious, and I guess in some ways I'm touching on uh, some of the points that Tony just mentioned in, in his presentation, but really the open and integrated markets um, are really being threatened by political and economic pressures for protectionism, and we're really seeing that through a reassertion of national, national sovereignty. Um, I mean, it's, it's fairly evident over here in the UK with Brexit, and we're even seeing it on a more micro scale if we think about Scotland wanting to leave the UK. Um, there's a backlash against globalisation, and the mi migration crisis is still evident. In Europe, uh, the main risk, as I've pointed out, relates to Brexit, and I guess it's the composition of the euro area. Um, we haven't seen this issue uh, arise since um, Greece was threatened with expulsion in 2015. The question is, will the euro area remain in its current form um, in the short term, you know, be it the next five years? Um, this will depend on the outcomes of the French and German elections this year, and we've also got Italy's election in February 2018. And I guess um, what we will see is any market concerns being reflected by a widening of the government um, held differentials and a loss of deposits from the banking system in those uh, weaker countries. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Debbie Cunningham, um, aside from the fact that now's the time for you to rub in the fact that the Steelers beat the Chiefs earlier this year, uh, any thoughts on the political risk discussion here? Um, you know, I think the political risk from a money market perspective is more, um, it, it, it's, it's U.S. centric to a large degree. Yeah. Uh, we've got so much change that's occurring here in the U.S. from a political perspective and, you know, the fact that we might have fiscal policy let's call it stimulus, to go along with what has been only monetary policy stimulus over the course of the last nine years or so, um, I think is, is throwing a lot of what's happening in the U.S. from a money market's perspective and thus a Treasury's perspective um, in, into a little bit of a funk. And although there are implications from a global standpoint, you know, um, trade barriers, uh, you know, border patrols, those sorts of things. The focus from what we're seeing in dollar rates and supply, I think, is more centric and um, concerned about what's happening from a U.S. standpoint. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Debbie. Greg, uh, what's your view, um, specifically around regulatory impact? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think the, the interesting thing to, to kind of think about is that uh, if you look at bank fundamentals, they're actually you know, fairly strong right now. Um, we've seen some earnings come out today, actually. And, uh, again, we should be in a fairly stable environment, you know, as you, you think about banking systems, particularly in the U.S. Uh, but, you know, we've had a couple of these geopolitical issues come up that are really throwing in uh, really uh, unexpected risk that, they can have a fairly material impact. I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, European elections, you know, at, at Fitch. Obviously, we focus on it more from a credit perspective, and 
our sovereign group recently put out a paper kind of talking about, uh, you know, to the, let's say if we, if we give an example of the French election to the extent they do end up coming out of the, uh, the euro, uh, you know, what would be the cost for the sovereign and the banking systems, you know, because some of the debt is denominated in, um, or, or issued in, in various jurisdictions and may be re-denominated or may have to stay in euro, so there's kind of a, a mismatch between the currencies. So, so these, these issues are kind of throwing in uh, credit concerns. Similarly, in the U.S., uh, to the extent, you know, there's banking deregulation, it, it kind of depends on what the banks decide to do with that if they, uh, you know, take advantage of, of the deregulation to reduce capital levels significantly. You know, that's not a, um, a credit positive for the banks. I mean, it, it, it may uh, increase lending and, and kind of risk taking, which uh, which could be positive for the economy. But it's kind of an issue that um, that's worth uh, keeping an eye on, uh, you know, on a bank by bank uh, kind of level. Thanks. Thanks so much, Greg. I appreciate it. Um, Let's let's talk a, a little bit about. Um, it, it's funny because, you know, Greg, you just made a comment about uh, the, the changing regulatory environment from a banking perspective, and and Tony had earlier talked about regulatory capture. Uh, there's another phrase there. It's called Stockholm syndrome, um, where you're a little bit afraid that you've been <laughs> taken it's, taken in to some extent. I think there's a lot of people that are wondering what's going to happen next because of that dynamic. Um, so let's talk, Debbie, about interest rates and specifically around uh, something that you and I had talked about, uh, Fed speak. Maybe, maybe first we can define what that word means to you. Well, um, you know, Fed speak is, is, is kind of slang from yeah. a, 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 a market, a monetary market perspective. Having said that, I think it's well um, understood that it's, you know, basically chatter. Um, that's very specifically directed from, you know, the powers that be on the FOMC, uh, especially, you know, Chair Yellen, um, uh, New York Fed President Dudley. There, there are some that, you know, have more power in their Fed speak than, right. than others um, on, on the, in the Federal Reserve. Um, ultimately, I think what we saw in the month of March was a very concentrated effort across all Fed speakers, really all of them, to get the market ready for the mid-March rate hike. We, we calendar flipped into the month of March with about a 30% expectation of interest rates being moved up by 25 basis points at that mid-March meeting. By the, time, by the time the meeting began, we were at 97%. It's not because we saw, you know, a whole host of economic data come in that was, you know, off the charts strong. It's because the Fed speakers that were out, you know, in that first week of March made a very concerted effort of making um, sure they addressed what was likely, you know, a, an environment where they would be increasing rates in the near term. Um, you know, I think looking at the rest of 2017, what are they doing now? Um, I, there was a little bit of banter after the last Fed meeting, um, the March Fed meeting, about maybe there would be an additional three rate hikes as opposed to, you know, the last dot plot information on that topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like it's a, a, a three rate hike year. Um, that seems to have subsided back into that dot plot expectation where uh, pot potentially June and September seem to be very live and on the table. And then that leaves open the fourth quarter that, depending upon what happens from both a fiscal policy perspective as well as from an economic data dependency standpoint, you know, there may or may not be a, 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 another rate hike that, that takes place during that, during that point. Um, what also is being discussed from a fourth quarter perspective, and again, part of this Fed speak that's kind of getting the bond market and the money markets used to it, is what they're going to do with the balance sheet, when and how, and, you know, starting to put some maybe broad time frames around that. And really the last time they did this, you know, back in 2013, I think it was, you had the, the huge tape, taper tantrum. 
um, from a bond market perspective. And the Fed speak at this point is very much concentrating on not having that same type of reaction when they talk about balance sheet reduction to some degree. Right. So not roiling the markets and having everyone focus on the fundamentals rather than whatever came out of somebody's mouth at a at a at a meeting. Yeah. So great, fantastic, Michelle Price. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, we, we're 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 focused here on the remaining interest rate uh, increases in the U.S. for the remainder of the year and uh, the behavior of the Fed Reserve here in the U.S. for the remainder of the year. What are your thoughts? Um, specifically around Bank of England and, and the European Central Bank and the disparity, not just in uh, policy, but maybe in their roadmap for the rest of 2017. Do you have any thoughts there on that? Um, on the Bank of England, I mean, I guess the, the talk in the market and in the press is uh, that rates will rise at some point in the future. Um, the, the real question is when. Uh, right. know, the base rate is, is 25 points. The feeling is it really can't go lower, so the expectation is a rise. Is, is a rise, but people don't know when. I mean, what is interesting is, um, you know, yesterday it was announced one of the lowest uh, mortgage rate five-year fixed offers. So, you know, there really is sort of a lot of uncertainty. You know, is it going to be six months, twelve months, eighteen months? We, we just don't know when. Great, thanks. And, and Greg, same question. What what do you see from your point of view, um, especially again around this uh, the, the uncertainty where you know here in the U.S. I think Debbie's point was th that there is uh, some sort of intention on telegraphing to the markets uh, what the Fed is intending to do in the short run. Maybe not throughout the course of the year, but at least trying to give some some more certainty, in, not just around interest rates, but also around um, unwinding the balance. Sheet and starting to address uh, QE, what do you feel, if, if you see anything, in terms of disparity between what we are seeing here with the U.S. Fed Reserve and maybe what you all are seeing with Bank of England and the European Central Bank? Yeah, and, and I think you can throw in the, the, uh, the Bank of Japan as well. I mean, we're, uh, in, in yeah. some of the conversations we're having with fund managers, you know, we're, we've been seeing uh, a little bit of a kind of interesting fun, phenomenon where they're getting more and more mandates from uh, from European investors and um, and Asian investors uh, to invest in in U.S. dollar um, assets. And I mean, certainly that that's not new. But um, some of the asset classes that these investors are going into are, are kind of interesting. Let's say, uh, for example, U.S. municipal bonds. You know, where these investors in Europe and, and Japan don't get any tax benefit, but they're still investing in these assets because they're perceived as is very safe, and uh, you know the yields are relatively um, relatively good for them. So I think it just gives you a little bit of perspective of um, how 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 prolonged of a low interest rate or negative interest rate environment these investors are expecting. Um, I think in the U.S., kind of maybe going back to my fundamentals um, point, you know, rising rates are generally positive for banks. Uh, and, and I think uh, banks in the U.S. are able to withstand a slightly faster uh, rising rate environment. Um, you know, so, so that's a, that's um, that's a positive. And and maybe uh, if, if I have a minute, just another point to raise about rates. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen kind of with relation to money funds, which um, banks and money funds are, are kind of two uh, important aspects for uh, for corporate tra um, cash management. So with money funds, we've seen them um, go through two Fed hikes already in a floating in a V fashion, uh, which, you know, maybe that's a, kind of a seg segue to our next topic, but we've seen some money go back into prime money funds. And I think this, um, you know, where investors are seeing these funds withstand the two rate hikes with really no, no major impact uh, is very reassuring for investors. And, and that's something we've been watching and I think investors are very focused on. Yeah, yeah, great. great. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, Tony, um, I, I want you to piggyback on something that, uh, that that they all said earlier, and then we'll talk about money market fund reform as well. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Debbie spoke about Fed speak, and when the the governor's speeches are aligned and uh, and, and and they tel telegraph policy, uh, that's extremely important. 
uh, because that keeps the markets calm and stable and actually dampens a little bit of volatility. One of the things we do at Treasury Strategies to tr try to sort of read the tea leaves uh, is a couple of the Federal Reserve Banks, or actually all the Federal Reserve Banks, publish white papers and they have staffs doing studies. Uh, and a couple of them have blogs, and particularly the New York Fed has the Liberty Street blog that, that we watch very carefully. And that seems to telegraph to us some of the thinking going on in the staffs of the Federal Reserve Banks that are likely to manifest themselves as policy direction six, nine, 12, 24 months ahead of time. There, there was a Liberty Street blog, for example, that talked about the unwinding of the Federal Reserve balance sheet and uh, the, the implications of doing that by 2021, which was basically mean hundreds of billions of dollars every year being sucked out of the economy. Uh, it's a fascinating read. Uh, there, there, there was one uh, uh, where you, 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 you can see some of the staffs at the Fed. You know, we talked earlier about possibility of some change in money fund rollback, or at least the fact that it was so unexpected that the House Financial Services Committee is saying so something's got to be done. Well, shortly after that hearing, uh, sure enough, our buddies at Liberty Street put out, put out a blog, this is on the New York Fed, uh, which concluded that, believe it or not, that the money fund regulations have made money fund management companies stronger. Now, we love our money fund management companies, but that is not the objective of the regulation. The regulation is to make the capital markets stronger. Uh, but it gives you an idea that, the, that they're trying to lay an academic uh, patina or halo around some policy things that, 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 that they would like to uh, espouse. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, going into our last uh, topic, um, Assuming we have we have time here, we, we may touch on something else. But Greg, you had mentioned as we were uh, closing out the conversation on interest rates and Fed speak, we had, we talked a little bit about money market fund reform, um, and obviously we were talking about that earlier as we were trying to determine where this uh, six hundred billion dollars went essentially, <laughs> and we're still trying to formulate hypotheses and prove those out now. Um, Greg, from your point of view, what are you hearing in terms of money market fund? Uh, reform, uh, I guess I wouldn't even say that. I, I, I think the question I'm asking is, what are you hearing in terms of prime versus government, the appeal of those two? Uh, because we think people are, are moving back from government to prime, but we don't have anything to, to prove that yet. So we're, we're going on anecdotal evidence for, for now. Uh, what thoughts do you have on that, Greg? Yeah, you know, maybe start in general. I'm yeah. very positive on the, on the money fund industry. You know, I think, um, the, one of the key points to, to remember about the reform is how orderly it's been. You know, we mentioned more than a trillion dollars moved from prime funds to government funds, and a lot of it really waited on, uh, you know, in prime funds until the, the very last minute, and the industry was able to absorb that uh, very well, no, no issues. Uh, and even since then, once prime, uh, prime funds or institutional prime funds started floating, I mentioned we went through two rate hikes. NAVs are, are barely moving, uh, fund managers are managing liquidity very conservatively. So I think it's, it's important to remember how, how orderly this, this whole thing went, um, uh, kind of went on with, with so much money moving, uh, moving around. Uh, so prime assets bottomed uh, probably around early November, and since then we've seen some money come back into prime. Um, you know, we're seeing that in the data and anecdotally and speaking to, to some investors and managers. Um, and I think some of the, the appeals are what I mentioned, uh, very, very stable kind of products, um, strong management. So you know, no issues came up since reform. And I think that's been one of the big things for investors. A lot of them moved into government funds, um, not as a structural move, but as kind of, you know, I don't want to go through reform. I want to see what happens. And right. now that the dust has settled uh, to an extent, I mean, we're, you know, six months into the reform already. Uh, investors are getting more comfort in how prime funds are managed in this new environment. And then I think the, um, the yield spread between prime and government funds have been fairly attractive uh, for, you know, for some investors. Like I mentioned, we, we've seen the early movers where uh, you know, yields, uh, yield spreads between prime funds and government funds seem to have kind of settled around like the mid-30s or 30 to 40 basis points. Uh, so we've seen some first movers go back into prime, and I think um, 
other investors are kind of getting more and more comfortable with, with these type of funds. And I think over this year we'll see a slow move back into prime, certainly not expecting all the entire trillion dollars to come back. Some of it was structural and will remain in government, but I think there's a, kind of a, a lot of space for, for this money to come back. Um, maybe one more point, we're also seeing a little bit of uh, move into ultra-short funds. Uh, I think investors are doing a, a better job maybe segmenting their cash, you know, keeping a little, uh, a little bit in government funds as immediate liquidity, uh, a little bit further out in prime funds, maybe a little bit more in ultra-short funds. Um, but ultra-short funds are, are kind of not as standardized as prime, so a little bit more work is required there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. It's funny because, you know, as a as a practitioner uh, working with our uh, corporate treasury clients, it was funny because we spoke about this, uh, this audience and uh, the people on this, on this panel, we've talked about this for a year at least, and I still know that I had corporate clients that were, that, that felt like they were caught off guard. Um, and, and as you would expect, based on the industry type, based on the personality type of the, the treasurer that was that was in, you know, any given corporate, you have some corporates that are going to, that were going to go to government and stay there. They're going to wait it out and just go to a safe place. And there's others that are taking more of a, a structured, practical, thoughtful approach on what makes the most sense. So what we expected to see isn't exactly, you know, a, a sloshing into government and a sloshing back out, but it's a slow movement as you described, Greg. And I think it's that slow movement is partially apprehension, um, but partially realizing that the the sky didn't fall, and uh, that there's still opportunities there for for corporate treasures. Um, Debbie, what what thoughts do you have? I, I don't know. We, we we haven't talked about this uh, in a while. You and I uh, directly on money market fund reform. What what thoughts do you have um, on on this topic? I don't know if. Sure. sure. Um, I, you know, I think uh, uh, trickles are starting to come back in, and by trickles, I would say, you know, from our, from just from Federated's perspective, our largest institutional prime money market floating net asset value fund. Phew, it's so hard to describe these funds now. Uh, no, right. Prime funds um, it w was was up about thirty percent in assets over the first quarter. That's less than a billion dollars. That fund used to trade, you know, daily billion dollar trades. So a part of the problem is the ultimate size of those funds yeah. And, yeah. and how they can be accommodative. You know, treasurers oftentimes have a minimum investable amount. Let's say that amount is 50 million, but then they have a maximum that they want to be in any one product. Let's say that's 10%. Well, let's mm -hmm. say that the size of the product that they're going into on a 10% basis only allows them a $25 million investment. It's, it's, it's kind of reworking, again, investment policies to make, you know, tiny footsteps um, usable and, and, and available for, for, you know, the practitioners who are comfortable with it. It's just, it's, it's a, you know, size to get size and it will happen, but it's, it's a slow process. Um, I think the other thing that I just sort of completed from an industry standpoint for the first quarter, looking at, uh, and I think we've talked about this before, um, comparing total returns now since you have a product mix in the money markets that actually does have some segment that has a floating net asset value associated with it, um, to compare total return, not just yield. And on a first quarter basis, it looked like um, on a yield spread, uh, versus the government sector, it was about a 38 basis point spread. But when you looked at it on a total return basis, it was about a 36 basis mm -hmm. point spread, which is reflective of not very much movement, you know, very little F in the FNAV. Um, nonetheless, it wouldn't be a full picture unless you looked at both components of performance, I think. Right. Right. You know, Treasury Strategies wrote a white paper about this. Gosh, it was maybe a year or two ago or something like that. A lot of people asking about that. We ended up doing a lot of work with uh, clients that were looking for help with investment policies. If anyone is interested in uh, taking a look at that white paper, please either comment on the webinar or send us an email after, and we'll be sure to send that out. Um, thanks, Debbie. Uh, Michelle, um, any thoughts around uh, this, this conversation before we talk about the last topic that you uh, that you wanted to bring up? Well, the 
In Europe, uh, the money market fund regulation isn't going to uh, be implemented until next year. Right. Rules right. have been ironed out. Uh, we're, I think we're waiting on EU ratification or something. Um, it will be interesting to see, uh, effectively, corporates will have this low volatility net asset value option, and it will be interesting to see the take-up um, of that, and if not, where are they going to put their money? Um, the banks really don't want it, so what are their other options? Under the mattress. <laughs> Might be the same. That's where it goes. <laughs> So uh, before we close out, Michelle, you and I were talking uh, a few days ago about virtual accounts, and uh, and I'd like you to kind of give me the quick overview here on this because it's it's not the very first time I've heard of it, but I, I'm not an expert in this, and it, it sounds like something that uh, maybe our audience is interested in. Sure, and I'll confess I'm not an expert on it either, but just um, it, it's a relatively new um, conversation or topical issue over here in Europe. Um, the reason I brought it up is the ACT had the Europe conference in Dusseldorf, Germany, the week before last, and it was quite topical there, hence I thought it might be interesting to yeah. your audience. Yep. Um, it's really arisen out of the changing regulatory environment, meaning that there's an increased cost for banks um, on notional pooling, and, and this is really because banks are being charged, uh, regulatory charged, by, on a gross basis rather than a, a net basis. And we're talking here Basel III's um, leverage coverage ratio, their uh, N NSFR, and the leverage ratio. I think they're all um, to play on this. But virtual bank accounts are really arrangements which are um, effectively a halfway house for corporates. They're really a, a hybrid between um, you know, physical cash concentration or zero balancing and notional pooling. Um, there is one real bank account and then multiple virtual accounts under that, but each of these virtual accounts has their own unique I-band. Um, but the funds are still commingled, effectively. Um, my conclusion was in reality, virtual accounts will not result in getting rid of all but one bank account, but more there will be a reduction in the number of bank or physical bank accounts held by corporates. Um, they'll still need to be a physical bank account per currency. Um, that won't be, so that you, know, you can't have them uh, across currencies. And I guess where I saw this issue on a, a time frame wise was um, there still seems to be a lot of legal issues which need to be ironed out. Um, but the basic functionality of these virtual accounts across the UK and continental Europe um, is expected uh, probably towards the end of this year, early next year. Interesting. Uh, we, you know, we, we've done a lot of research on the regulatory environment, and uh, before anyone goes out and starts just signing up for virtual accounts, <laughs> be aware that there's a regulatory uh, issue around that. Specifically, well, I don't know specifically, but potentially 385 rules might be might be an issue there. But but I don't know yet. I'm not an expert, and uh, certainly well, something to legal, to look into. A lot of legal issues which are right. being you know, sorted out by the lawyers. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And, and really, thanks so much to everyone who participated in today's panel. Again, Michelle Price, uh, the Associate Policy and Technical Director of the Association of Corporate Treasurers, uh, Debbie Cunningham, Chief Investment Officer of Federated Investors, and Greg Pavilovich, the Director of Fitch Ratings. Uh, on behalf of Tony Carfang and myself, Thank you all so much for listening in today. Uh, as usual, a link and copy of today's materials are going to be shared with all registrants in a few days. And again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me or any of our panelists at our respective emails. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll see you at the next uh, briefing. Have a good day.